Well, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have a seminar by uh, Andrew Gearing. Before we start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge country. So we acknowledge the traditional owners in their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and we pay their respect to their ancestors and their descendants. A few messages in housekeeping rules. This seminar will take about an hour. You can type in your questions at the Q&A tab at the bottom, and you can do that throughout the seminar, and then we will pick out some questions of that at the end. So please type your questions in as you go along. Uh, now today's seminar will be about uh, preserving the Aussie lifestyle through research on turf, and is given by uh, Associate Professor Andrew Gearing. Andrew is a virologist of fame, has done many interesting things in virology, came from uh, DAF about 10 years ago to UQ Quafi, and he is really passionate about plant diseases, but he's also passionate about his lifestyle, which involves sort of barbecues and cricket, and what they have in common is that is turf grass. So when there is a problem with turf, Andrew will come to the rescue. Turf is actually quite important because after trees and algae, turf produce most of the oxygen we breathe today. And I sort of had a look at some statistics and you, for one hectare of turf makes enough oxygen for about 160 people to live. So every person needs a little bit over five square meters of turf which produces enough oxygen for a day. Now, my office is smaller than five square meters, but the other problem is that I haven't got any windows, so it doesn't work everywhere. Now, uh, I'd like to hand over to Andrew and start his seminar. Well, th thank you, Andre, and uh, good afternoon to everyone um, on the webinar, uh, the first I've given. Um, as Andre said, I'd like to talk about our research on turf. It's uh, rather a new venture for me. I've been doing it for about three years and it's uh, been a very uh, steep learning curve. Uh, it's something that I really, other than mowing the lawn and being a, a keen gardener, I didn't know much about the industry before, before I embarked on these projects. So as Andre said, um, we utilise turf in one way or another um, almost uh, every uh, day of the year, in, uh, especially within cities, uh, either through sporting activities, recreational activities, uh, or just general park uh, facilities. As uh, turf farmers shipping, most people also are, are not very familiar, unlike, say, for example, the wheat industry that... Uh, people would probably have some reasonable general knowledge about it. Uh, the turf industry, I'm assuming many people don't uh, know much about it, like uh, I didn't. And uh, I just wanted to give a brief introduction of, of the industry, and then I'll progress on to um, talking about some of the research we're doing. Uh, I forgot to mention um, uh, in my title slide, um, of course, I will use the uh, the pronoun we quite a bit in this uh, webinar, uh, but the we is quite a large uh, team of people that have been uh, working on this uh, area. In particular, I'd like to highlight uh, Dr. Narch Tran, who's also working at the ESP, and also uh, Ms. Ai Chin Tao, uh, who did an honours uh, with us. And uh, many people uh, have helped in some way or another along the way too. So um, natural turf has many environmental and uh, public health benefits. Um, a, a city full of cement and uh, bricks is a very hot city. Uh, turf uh, helps to cool the environment down. Uh, so uh, well irrigated turf uh, around the house can cool the temperature by around four degrees compared to ambient. Uh, looking at uh, bitumen or synthetic turf, it does uh, exactly the opposite. It can really uh, uh, heat up the uh, atmosphere a lot. And you can see quite nicely uh, in that image of the sporting field um, at the bottom half of the slide there, an astroturf um, 
uh, field, um, and it's uh, come up being very red in the infrared photograph compared to the uh, the very cool and relaxing blue of the the, the cricket pitch and the, and the field around the cricket pitch. Um, turf is also very important in other ways, uh, very important for soil erosion control. Uh, one of the first things that will be put down after a new road is, uh, has been uh, laid is uh, some kind of uh, uh, turf uh, along the edges to stop uh, erosion. Um, turf uh, next to the road can very much dampen the noise of the traffic uh, coming from the road. As uh, Andre mentioned in the introduction, it's a, um, um, it's a carbon trap and a, uh, and a means of produ producing oxygen. It also uh, helps uh, filter the system, trapping dust, dirt and uh, smoke. Uh, can change the pH of the water running off the, the ground. And importantly, especially last uh, summer, not this summer, uh, it's a very important bushfire retardant. And uh, most species, if they're uh, green and living, uh, are very effective at uh, being fire retardants around a house. Now the uh, turf industry is uh, a very large and dispersed industry around Australia. Um, you'd be surprised at the, uh, the centres that have uh, uh, turf farms close to them. Of course, the major cities like Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne have many turf farms uh, around their perimeter, but even uh, small cities like uh, Rockhampton, Yapoon, uh, Bundaberg, each of these, uh, I guess, uh, medium or large towns will also have uh, turf farms in some way servicing them as, as well. The, the value of the um, industry is nearly $300 million, making it a, a medium-sized horticultural industry in Australia. Uh, 230, which is a conservative, conservative estimate of the number of turf farms in Australia, and employing around uh, 1,800 staff. Uh, the most important turf varieties, 40% uh, uh, of the turf grown is uh, green cooch or its hybrids. I'll mention the grasses a bit later in the next slide. Uh, second in importance is buffalo grass. Uh, although buffalo grass uh, normally commands a much higher price than um, uh, green cooch. So if you're looking at the total value of production, uh, buffalo grass is the most important turf species in Australia and followed by 21% 20 of the industry being zoysia, uh, the various zoysia uh, species. And zoysia again is a, is a premium turf species. So uh, those three, the three largest uh, portions of the pie are green cooch, uh, that is either a, a straight cyanodin dactylon um, or often called common green cooch. And there's also hybrids such as uh, cyanodin uh, dactylon times uh, transvalensis. Uh, some uh, trade names you might know, wintergreen um, is a straight cyanodin dactylon. Uh, grasses like Santa Ana and Tiff Tuff uh, hybrids between Dactylon and Transvalensis. Uh, green Kirch has been a, a popular turf species for, for many years. It's, uh, it's virtually bulletproof, it's drought tolerant, has a nice fine leaf. Importantly for the sporting surfaces, it can be cut very short. Uh, so for example, many of the uh, lawn bowls greens or the, um, the golf uh, greens uh, or cricket pitches uh, are composed of, of green cooch, uh, where the, the length of the blade is no more than a few millimetres. And also very important for sporting surfaces, it's uh, very tolerant of foot traffic. So a lot of the major stadia around Australia, such as Suncorp Stadium and the Gabba, uh, are, are planted with uh, green, green cooch, although in winter uh, that cooch might be over, is oversown with uh, grasses like perennial rye, rye grass uh, when the 
green cooch goes dormant uh, in winter. Uh, buffalo grass, you might have heard of varieties such as Sir Walter and Palmetto, um, is a very lush, soft, broad leaf. Um, it's very fast growing, which can be good or bad. Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I guess, bad at this time of the year when there's lots of moisture and, uh, and heat and the lawn needs to be cut um, every weekend. It uh, has good uh, shade tolerance and it's also uh, naturally, it's a coastal pioneer and we've seen examples of it uh, almost uh, growing in salt water, so it's uh, salt tolerant. And the fine, uh, final major group of grasses is uh, zoysia. Um, zoysia, I guess, would, would be uh, considered the, the growth uh, growth section of, of the market at the moment, becoming very popular. Uh, Zoysia japonica, uh, Zoysia matrella and um, macrantha. Interestingly, macrantha, uh, I talk about macadamia being one of our only domesticated crops uh, from Australia. Zoysia macrantha is also native to Australia and it has been uh, selected for use as turf. Uh, so Zoysia macrantha, you might have heard of cultivars such as Nara, uh, they're a native grass, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a novel, novelty product there for Australia. The zoysia is uh, favoured because it's got a fine, light, fine leaf, slow growing, so it doesn't need to be mown very often. Also has very good shade tolerance. It doesn't require uh, much fertiliser to uh, maintain a nice green uh, coloration. Has a very tight sod, so it suppresses weeds. So again, a, a nice premium grass. Now the threats to the turf industry, these, uh, I, I guess these are my uh, perceptions from talking to farmers in the, in the last three years. A uh, bit of a story, we had our, uh, probably our very first field trip on, on one of our projects to go meet an industry leader. And I, we rocked up for a meeting and um, being a plant pathologist, I asked him um, what he considered to be the major threat to the industry. And with my plant pathology blinkers on, I was hoping he'd say it was a, a plant pathogen. But he actually said it was shrinking house blocks. Um, many of you, if you've driven along the Mount Lindsay or Cunningham Highways, have seen the new suburbs uh, sprouting up like mushrooms. Uh, the developers to make uh, the new houses affordable to first home buyers uh, are shrinking the, the block size. So even out in the uh, very outer suburbs of, of Brisbane, uh, for example, you may still only get a 405 square metre block and, uh, and a McMansion in the middle of your 405 square metre block. So that doesn't uh, leave much room for, for turf. So gone of the... Uh, the, the quarter acre blocks. Of course, like all agricultural industries, water is, is important. Uh, unusually for the turf industry, it's uh, important both at the place of uh, production plus also the, the place of, uh, of use of the commodity. Uh, that like all ornamental uh, horticultural industries, it's very prone to uh, uh, water restrict, oh, um, very influenced by water restrictions. So if there are restrictions on uh, watering of the garden, then uh, turf and all kinds of uh, nursery products will go down in demand. Uh, the third threat, I've called it commodification of turf. Uh, there are premium turf varieties such as um, uh, zoysia and uh, buffalo grass, but uh, for uh, turf species like green cooch, common green cooch, uh, it's uh, very commonly grown uh, by many, many farmers. And basically developers use, as a, use it as a cheap way to cover uh, bare ground and they're seeking the cheapest price per square metre um, to put over the bare dirt. Uh, there's no premium for well-grown turf, unlike a you know a well-grown avocado or well-grown mango, where you might be able to sell it for twice as much. You get no no benefit from putting additional inputs into in, into into green cooch, uh, other than sort of uh, you know the basics. So, for example, if they wanted to 
uh, put fungicides on, they'd have to look at their uh, uh, cost uh, return margin to see if it was worthwhile to do. Uh, the third is uh, synthetic turf, not, not such a big issue in, in Brisbane with plenty of natural rainfall, but if you go into some of the suburbs of Perth or uh, Murray Bridge, for example, um, people are, are, are using uh, uh, artificial turf. Um, I've also seen it in some of the canal estates um, of, of uh, uh, the Sunshine Coast. And um, uh, of course, as with all plant industries, uh, pests and, and pathogens are, are a threat um, to the industry as well. And the right hand side of the slide, I've in, included a, a picture of the fall army worm. Uh, those people out of uh, biosecurity may not have realised that in the last couple of years we've had the introduction of the, the fall army worm, uh, which is uh, one of the major pests worldwide, and particularly a, uh, a pest of uh, graminaceous uh, crops. Uh, like maize in Africa, it's caused uh, starvation, uh, marching through and eating up all the uh, cereal crops there. And uh, one could expect that in the near few years, it could be, uh, become a problem with uh, turf as well. Now, turf, turf is, uh, I guess it's got its uh, uh, unique uh, aspects that dif uh, differ from, uh, you know, traditional crops that make uh, pests and pathogens more difficult to control. Um, pests and pathogens love uh, monocultures and you, um, the aim of a good turf farmer is to produce a, uh, a, a perfect um, monoculture without any weeds. Um, often the plant growth is pushed. Um, basically the farmer wants to cycle as quickly as they can. Um, to harvest and then to uh, have the uh, turf regrow and be ready for harvest uh, as quickly as possible. So it is pushed through um, a lot of irrigation and fertiliser, uh, particularly nitrogen fertilisers, so very rapid growth and uh, makes it ideal for pathogens as, as well. Very few farmers exercise crop rotation, uh, I would say, in most cases, it's, uh, it's the same paddock of the same grass uh, for 20 years where they harvest and allow it to, to regrow. Some of, the, uh, 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 some of the farmers are now uh, at least resting the paddock. They're um, uh, digging it up after harvest and then uh, replanting with uh, shredded stolons, but many people still uh, just allow the uh, grass to re regrow from ribbons. Uh, it's basically a perennial, perennial crop, um, so there's no break to allow uh, um, eradication of pathogens. Uh, pathogens will uh, persist from one generation to another, particularly plant viruses that I will describe uh, later. And uh, Farmers tend to be uh, heavily reliant on chemicals for pest and disease management. There's uh, little flexibility for other uh, forms of, of uh, um, integrative pest and disease management. Now, uh, one of the projects we've uh, worked on is um, a disease syndrome. I, I call it a syndrome because it uh, doesn't have a, a, a single cause and uh, what one person might cause called buffalo grass yellowing in New South Wales is very different uh, to what another person in Western Australia would call uh, buffalo uh, grass yellowing. It's considered one of the uh, greatest problems on turf farms uh, on the east coast of, of Australia. Um, it, it has been the talking point in the last uh, few, few summers. Um, one of the big issues is that when you do get yellowing uh, occurring, you also get uh, uh, degeneration of, of the root system and it becomes very hard to harvest the turf. The turf mat doesn't bind and it uh, falls apart, uh, which is basically makes the turf unharvestable. 
Um, the symptoms come and go. So at some times of the year they're present, at other times uh, not. And also uh, when they transplant the turf uh, to the final destination, to the consumer, uh, the symptoms can disappear uh, when uh, the turf is replanted. And the symptoms are often non-responsive to fungicide applications. I guess that's the favourite chemical uh, of the farmers to apply to, uh, to control disease, but uh, uh, in many cases there's no response uh, to fungicides. In some cases there is though. So, uh, as virologists, we were aware of a disease uh, in the Gulf states of the USA, in Texas and Louisiana, a disease called St. Augustine Decline, or SAD uh, for short, which is a, a lovely name for a plant disease. Uh, SAD's been uh, around and well described since uh, probably uh, the mid 20th uh, century, so it's, it's a very well-known disease. In the States, well, um, they call buffalo grass uh, St. Augustine grass. Uh, we're about the only country in the world that call it buffalo grass. Uh, SAD, as I said, is most important in the uh, southeastern USA, and it's caused by a virus called panicum mosaic virus. Um, Panicum mosaic virus is probably indigenous uh, to this region of the world. However, we've had it introduced into Australia and it was first reported in 2011. The symptoms of SAD just start off as uh, mild chlorotic mottling or stippling of the leaves. But then after a year or so, the symptoms start to resemble nitrogen or iron deficiency, uh, as in the photograph on the right hand side. Uh, the plants, uh, the turf becomes less vigorous um, and it allows uh, weeds to invade. Um, the symptoms are worse than in shade and then eventually the turf uh, dies. So our initial hypothesis is that the buffalo grass yellowing was something like this, uh, the sad disease in the uh, United States. Hence, uh, in a very narrow window, we um, finished our last survey about a week before um, all, all uh, the interstate travel bans uh, from COVID uh, started to, to come into place. Uh, we just managed to escape out of Perth and uh, about the Friday before Queensland uh, shut its borders. Uh, but we did surveys of eight farms in southeast Queensland uh, on the Golden Sunshine Coast and in the Brisbane Valley. Uh, Ten farms in the Hawkesbury and Hunter Valleys uh, near Sydney. And nine farms, uh, Perth to Bustleton. Fortunately, had to cancel surveys of Melbourne. Uh, but we did take samples, brought them back to the lab. Uh, we tested for viruses and fungi and also took some nematode uh, samples, uh, some soil samples, sorry, and gave them to the nematologists at that to have a look at those uh, to see if we could find a cause, a consistent cause of uh, the, uh, the buffalo grass yellowing. Uh, in short, we found three different viruses uh, associated with, associated with uh, buffalo grass yellow, these being Sugarcane mosaic virus, and you can see on the left hand side, it's a very uh, striking symptom of, of yellow and green. So you can quite imagine that being the cause of the, of the yellowing disease. Also, panicum mosaic virus, the cause of uh, uh, St. Augustine decline in the USA. And although we weren't looking for it, we did submit some samples uh, of panicum mosaic virus and sugar came mosaic virus for high throughput sequencing. And as luck would have it, we also uh, found a second, a third virus, uh, which is a, a type of virus called the Napo virus. You can see that electron micrograph there, you can see the long filaments, which are typical of sugarcane mosaic virus, uh, but blue and yellow arrows point to uh, small spherical particles, uh, which are a Napo virus. So there was a mixed infection there and a, a new type of virus that was new to science uh, that we're just describing now. Uh, no knowledge of its uh, 
biological characteristics, its transmission, nor even the symptoms it causes. Um, of these viruses, sugarcane mosaic virus was uh, rampant down in New South Wales. We found it on uh, nine of the 10 farms there. Um, the incidences, incidences on some farms uh, are approaching 100%. Uh, others, uh, maybe only 20 or 40%. Uh, we did find sugarcane mosaic virus on one farm in Queensland and on two farms uh, in Western Australia. We found that the, the pathogen in a range of uh, um, buffalo grass um, varieties. Uh, in nature, this virus is transmitted in a non-persistent manner by aphids, uh, also likely transmitted um, on, on the mowing blades, on sap-contaminated mowing blades. And of course, if little turf that's infected is sold, it will spread over long distances uh, uh, through that method. Um, the control would likely involve decontaminating mowing blades, uh, mowing when there's not moisture or dew uh, on the grass, so the uh, mowing blades don't become uh, sap contaminated quite as much. And, and in the USA, there are some resistant varieties uh, that could be uh, used uh, if they were uh, suitable for Australian conditions and of course to uh, replant the paddock with uh, uh, new, newly sourced grass that is healthy. Uh, paddock and mosaic virus we only found on two farms in New South Wales and only in uh, Palmetto, uh, one, a single uh, variety that interestingly comes from the uh, USA so it likely came in to Australia on that variety. Um, again, it's transmitted by mowing and, and turf and similar uh, control strategies to sugarcane mosaic virus. Uh, this new Nepo virus that we discovered uh, is the, was ended up being one of the more widespread of the, of, of the viruses. We retrospectively went through our RNA extracts and tested them with uh, PCR primers and we found it to be, uh, you know, very widespread, uh, both the, in, in, geographically and also in the varieties it was, uh, it was present in. We really don't understand how it's transmitted. It's uh, possible looking at some of the relatives of this virus that it might be might transmitted. Um, it's also likely to be transmitted by mowing and salad living turf and again, decontamination of uh, uh, of mowing equipment and mowing when dry would help uh, control this virus. Uh, we looked at the genetic diversity of sugarcane mosaic virus. Uh, what we found is that it is uh, amongst almost every single uh, turf sample we had a, had a unique sequence variant. So it looked like there were multiple introductions of sugarcane mosaic virus uh, into, into buffalo grass. Uh, we hypothesized that it's coming from the surrounding vegetation. Uh, for example, there were different uh, sequence variants in Sir Walter. Uh, so it certainly wasn't a single introduction and in the movement of infected turf, but uh, infection from some kind of uh, outside reservoir. Uh, we found that the virus was related to the blue cooch and the sabi grass strains uh, in Queensland. So these are possible alternative hosts, uh, but it was very distantly related to the sugarcane strains uh, in Queensland. So there's uh, unlikely to be a linkage between those two crops there. Uh, Unlike sugarcane mosaic virus, panic and mosaic virus was um, very homogenous, um, not much sequence variation at all. Um, so we hypothesized that there was a single introduction into Australia, uh, likely in the, uh, the variety Palmetto, which is a variety that was developed in Florida and probably was imported in the late uh, 1980s. Uh, because of the very uh, restricted distribution of this virus and the, uh, the fact that it's only in one cultivar, we believe that it, it could possibly be er eradicated from uh, production, places of production, although it would be difficult to eradicate from Australia because it would have already been 
uh, sold and planted in many, uh, many gardens uh, already uh, in Sydney. Uh, some places, particularly in Queensland and then also in New South Wales, we found examples of um, uh, buffalo grass yellows that weren't associated with any virus infection. Uh, when we pulled up stolons of these plants, they had very unhealthy root systems. You can see the middle photograph there. Uh, the roots should be nice, white and fresh. Um, but in that photograph there, the roots are, are, are quite necrotic. Uh, also leaf spots as well. Uh, so Nara and others uh, did uh, isolations uh, of, of, for fungi um, from these uh, uh, diseased tissues. Uh, as expected, we got a variety of uh, fungi from the plant, but uh, the most consistently associated type of fungus was a, a new species of curvularia. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, the, the, the tree there, the only uh, take home fact from the tree uh, that I want you to get is that there's a new species there, an undescribed species from uh, uh, buffalo grass. When we had this type of yellowing, the yellowing tended to start uh, along tram tracks. Uh, and those tram tracks were the old turf ribbons uh, from the previous season that the turf had been allowed to, to grow out from. Uh, because it's a, an older crop, there uh, tends to be um, built up with thatch. When I use the term thatch, I mean dead uh, organic material below the, the layer of green living uh, turf, uh, be that, be that uh, dead stolons or, or, or dead leaves. Uh, so that probably created the conditions that were favourable for the fungus. And if you look at the literature, curvularia is favoured by moisture. Uh, also the overuse of, of nitrogen fertilisers. Um, and uh, if you look at some of the production practices of the farmers where they see yellowing, they're, uh, often their instant response is to put more nitrogen fertiliser on to ameliorate the yellowing symptoms and it might have been actually encouraging uh, the epidemics of this, this Kerbal area. We did find cases where um, both uh, the plant was both infected with, with the virus and also um, a Kerbal area and they seem to have uh, worse symptoms so it's possible there was some kind of synergistic inter interaction between the virus and the fungus. The virus it somehow was uh, suppressing the defence systems of the plant, uh, making it more susceptible to infection by the curvial area. The next disease and the final disease I'd like to talk about is uh, a disease called Cooch smut. Uh, and this is a disease caused by Eustolago uh, cynodontis. Uh, it has uh, peculiar biology in that the fungus invades the florets of the inflorescence and replaces the seed embryo with a mass of black spores. And you can look at that photograph there and you can see that the sooty masses of spores on the inflorescences. It has a narrow host range uh, confined to cyanide and dactylon. And we've had it in Australia for a very long time. It, it's basically a cosmopolitan fungus found wherever uh, cyanide and dactylon uh, um, occurs. We did uh, renewed surveys for this disease, including this farm up at uh, New Pirin, Big Al's, Big Al there in the uh, yellow t-shirt, um, surveyed his farm and we got new records. So it's uh, still very common in the environment. Uh, uh, you know, in Australia and also still very common on, on turf farms that grow uh, common green cooch. The economic impacts of cooch smut, um, there are quite a few. You can see in the top left hand photograph, the, the cooch really um, turns the plant into a zombie plant, a spore producing plant. It makes it grow much more upright. Uh, so it's very leggy and ugly, and it's particularly noticeable in uh, very prostrate um, forms of, of, of green cooch. It causes mild chlorosis. Um, a, a kind of unexpected impact of the disease was uh, much greater wastage uh, during harvest. Uh, 
the loss of vigor in the surface part is mirrored by loss of vigor of the root system as well. And when you don't have a very vigorous root system, the turf mat uh, breaks apart. And when that happens, the roll breaks and it's called uh, wastage and that's loss of uh, income for the farmer. And you can see here Nars, uh, uh new shoes uh, covered in uh, black spores there. They certainly produce copious amounts of spores that get on clothing, on dog's fur, and also in the air, and the, the spores are probably allergenic, which is uh, not, not a good thing for, for sports fields or uh, recreational areas. Um, often uh, you'll hear even pathologists say, uh, all you have to do is mow the plant, get rid of those ugly infected heads and you've controlled the disease. However, that's not simple, but it is not that simple. The, the fungus is uh, systemic throughout the plant and uh, now developed a, a very nice PCR assay uh, for the fungus. And she was able to detect the fungus in the roots and the rhizomes and stolons, the leaves, even if you couldn't see symptoms. Uh, so, uh, cutting, off, uh, uh, cutting off the flower head is uh, just like kicking your dirty clothes under the, the rug. The fungus persists and it will keep coming back. Of course, the industry wanted uh, to use fungicides to control it. So we did some uh, uh, fungicide tests um, and we found uh, that some of the systemic uh, fungicides, particularly uh, a mixture of azoxystropin and uh, propiconazole uh, gave reasonably uh, uh, good uh, um, eradication of, of the, or curing of the plant of the disease. So there is uh, prospects that uh, fungicides could be used uh, by the industry to control the disease. Uh, we uh, have um, spoken to some of our closest farming collaborators and they've tried it and uh, our plot trials seem to be uh, uh, valid, validated by the, the farmers' observations when they uh, sprayed on the turf. So I think I've been going for 40 minutes, which is, is about the time I meant uh, to speak in this turf to uh, leave open time for, for questions. Um, you can see here me uh, reliving my fantasies to be a test cricketer, uh, photograph taken on the Cricket Oval uh, at, at UQ by the Coffee um, Communications team. Uh, I think when we uh, released a, a, a press statement at the beginning of our Cooch uh, uh, Smart Project. But turf, to me, turf is quality of life um, without turf. We wouldn't have the AFL Grand Final, which would be very, very, uh, uh, very important event for me, and also the Boxing Day Test. Uh, turf is public health. If you can't get outside and utilise the open spaces, we're going to have uh, children inside putting on weight, playing um, uh, Xbox and other computer games. Uh, it presents uh, special challenges to plant protection. Uh, the production systems are very intensive and there's uh, some of the, the more tried and uh, improving methods of plant uh, control of plant pathogens aren't available, such as, uh, uh, a ro as rotation. And for an industry that is, big, is as big as it is, $300 million, and that's just the farm gate value, I've got to mention that uh, turf, unlike bananas, turf kit continues to get used uh, for years after it's uh, sold and requires plant protection services. Uh, it is really underserviced by research and University of Queensland. Coffee is the last remaining turf pathology research team in Australia. And uh, I must mention Chris Lambrini's also uh, does some very good work uh, on turf and uh, uh, tolerance to stresses like uh, drought and, uh, and salt. So uh, UQ is a bit of a, um, 
one of the last uh, vestiges of, of research in turf uh, in Australia. So I think it's important that we continue it on for such an important uh, industry. So at that uh, point, I will stop my webinar and open up for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, there are a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A. So if you have any new questions, please type them in and then I will read them out and then Andrew will try to uh, answer them, I hope. So Andrew, you want to, the first question is really, when you looked at uh, for nematodes in the soil in, in the first part of your seminar, did you also look for ground pearls? All right, so I can guess you uh, asked that question. Hi, Anthony. <laughs> um, uh, not, not specifically, but uh, I, I, I guess we would have noticed uh, if, if, if they were there. Um, uh, so no, no, we didn't, didn't see any, any, any ground, ground pearls in the uh, turf, no. Now, Andrew Fletcher had a question concerning what causes resistance to these viruses. I think I'd reword that if there is any resistance to these viruses in grasses. Uh, there is actually, and, and some of our field observations uh, suggest that some of the Australian varieties have resistance. For example, um, panic and mosaic virus. Um, often varieties, different varieties have grown on the same uh, same farm and there may not be more than a, a, a dirt track separating the two, two, two um, paddocks of, of turf and certainly the moeds would go across uh, both varieties so there was every opportunity for the spread of panic and mosaic virus. That was for one farm we went to where we found the, the, the virus in Palmetto yet uh, five metres away in a paddock of sapphire we didn't find the disease and to me that indicates that there's a very good chance that SAPA uh, has some form of, of resistance to the, to, to the virus. In the States, uh, where most of the breeding work occurs um, for uh, uh, viruses, well, um, there's uh, good resistance to panic and mosaic virus that specifically bred for resistance. Um, so uh, varieties such as Floritam, have uh, resistance, have been bred for resistance uh, to panic and mosaic virus. Um, ironically, they also have shrimp and mosaic virus there and uh, the situation is reversed. Floritan is very susceptible to shrimp and mosaic virus, uh, but palmetto is, is resistant to sugar cane mosaic virus. So they don't, unfortunately, they don't have uh, both sources of resistance in the same same variety. I, I, I suspect it's quite a complex uh, uh, polygenic resistance um, because uh, um, I, I, I don't think the plants are absolutely immune uh, to the viruses, but they tend to have much, much lower incidences, incidences of the virus. Uh, I certainly think there's potential for selection for resistance. So another question is, and this one is from a uh, fellow virologist, John Thomas, whether or not there are any buffalo grass cultivars resistant in Australia, resistant to panic and mosaic virus? Uh, well, um, that, that, as you would know, John, that uh, research we described was only uh, six months long. So it was basically a scoping study to look at the causes of uh, buffalo grass yellowing and we didn't uh, didn't actually get to screen any varieties but um, um, in the states those varieties that derive from bitter blue uh, such as um, uh, palmetto is a hybrid of bitter blue and, a, a, and another variety uh, that seems to have some resistance against uh, sugar cane mosaic virus so um, I'm, I'm sure if we were to look closely, I think the prospects of finding some uh, usable resistance would be quite good. So I, I, I definitely think that's a priority for research in the future. Now, Liz Dan has the question, which is sort of interesting because the, you found a new na napo virus in these grasses, but it's always associated with other viruses. So 
is it actually pathogenic on its own? And uh, can you test that? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I probably didn't explain it. When we, when we retrospectively went through all our um, RNA extracts that we tested for sugarcane mosaic bark, etc., we did find examples of uh, single infections just with the, the Nepo virus. Um, we haven't, uh, unfortunately, we haven't um, been, our funding ran out and we haven't been out in the paddock again to try and correlate symptoms with um, uh, the presence of the virus alone. Although, um, as a group, Nepo viruses, they do produce symptoms, but the symptoms seem, appear to be often quite transient, so they uh, come and go. And interestingly, there's a disease called barley yellows uh, in, in France, which is caused by a Nepo virus called Arabis mosaic virus, and that uh, produces a, a, a general yellowing symptom, a bit like uh, the buffalo grass yellows. So uh, it, it could fit the bill as being a cause of the uh, buffalo grass yellows with the symptoms coming and going, but that's something that we need to to, to test and also I, I think there's a very high likelihood that it, the Nepo virus is synergistically interacting with sugarcane mosaic virus to make uh, a much worse uh, disease than either virus alone. Yeah, now following on from that, uh, Yuo Zhang has a question whether or not you can control these viruses with RNAi. Uh, of course you could, yes. Um, uh, well, Polyviruses, panicoviruses, they're, um, um, they're, they're all very good targets for uh, RNAi control and there'd be a very high likelihood you'd get, um, uh, get immunity using, using that, that, that strategy. Um, if anyone from the BioClay team is, is, uh, is listening, it would probably be a very good um, uh, system to apply BioClay uh, given the, um, the you know, it's a, it's a beautiful crop to work with. It's a nice uniform, perfectly level crop. So it's very easy to spray uh, various chemicals and fertilizers onto, onto the crop. So uh, there is potential uh, for that. Genetic engineering, I'm sure it would work, but uh, again, it's the old uh, issue of uh, whether it'd be acceptable to the public to have uh, GM turf, particularly as a, as a lot of these grasses uh, uh, masquerade as weeds uh, sometimes, like buffalo grass is both a, a lovely turf and sometimes a weed as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but uh, you know, I, I think to begin with, I'd, I'd like them to recognise the problem, uh, to get some good data on the impact of the disease and how it's hurting their. Uh, uh, hurting their pocket um, and then to at least try replanting uh, and to see what improvements they can get by replanting. Yeah, now I have a, a final question, which is a, more of a personal one. Like many people like me probably all well, have smut in their lawn. And so you go and mow it, but I think grass is a bit like an iceberg where 90% of the biomass is in the roots and the ground and what you showed is that the smut is actually inside the roots. So what is the solution to, what would you recommend to solve that problem? Well, uh, well fungicides is, is the start. It's probably not the, 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 the full answer. Um, we have thought that um, we could uh, take um, advantage of the fact that the, um, the fungus modifies the, uh, the phenotype of the plant and it sends it growing upwards rather than laterally. So if we were to do strip spraying, um, we would knock out with, with Roundup, for example, uh, knock out a, um, uh, a strip of grass and by chance we would kill some of the infected, infected plants and it would be more likely that the healthy grass, because it's programmed to run laterally across the ground, would recolonize uh, that, um, that soil, whereas the infected grass that is programmed to go upwards would uh, uh, remain growing upwards. So if we were to do 
uh, quite a bit of strip spraying would eventually eradicate the disease in, in, in that manner. And of course, you could do spot spraying if you, if uh, with Roundup if you, if the disease is not too too widespread within the uh, within the turf. But um, yeah, so my, uh, so my lawn will start looking like a zebra then. And it could do. It could do. But you, um, um, uh, yes, you'll uh, have to become a lawn fanatic, uh, Andre, like uh, the Facebook page, and uh, uh, have. Uh, uh, pride in your lawn and, and get it nicely cleaned up. So, all right. If there's no more questions, then uh, <coughs> on the uh, chat is also a link to one of Andrew's uh, um, uh, media articles. So there is a lot more about that. Uh, next week. So thanks, Andrew, for the seminar and uh, thanks for the people who put in uh, questions. So next week we have a seminar by Anna Koltanov that will be about asexual seed formation in sorghum. You have to know that that seminar you need to register for it. So you cannot just log in. So please register sometime this week. Otherwise, you will not have access to it. And it will also not be recorded because it is an internal seminar unlike the other ones which are open to anyone. So if there's no further issues or questions, I'd like to uh, join me in thanking Andrew for a seminar and we'll hope to see you next week. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.